We may or may not be live. Should we be live? I think we're live. Hello, God bless, and welcome. I'm Kevin Haggerty. This is the God Logic Project, where we discuss maintaining a Christian worldview in a post-Christian America, what that looks like. Today on the show, we're going to be talking about a book called The Naked Communist and 45 points uh, uh, that, that an FBI agent uncovered that the Communist Party was trying to infiltrate the United States government and the United States society. So they put together these 45 points uh, of, of a way to subversively attack the United States because they couldn't beat them militarily. This is, of course, during the, in the 50s, 1959, during the Cold War. So we're going to talk about a lot of that. We'll see how it applies to our schools and our churches uh, and our media. We're going to be taking your calls, so stay tuned. Uh, make sure you get in on that. And uh, in the meantime, the introduction music. <laughs> Hello, God bless, and welcome. I'm Kevin Haggerty, and this is the God Logic Project. Shut up, Kevin. I'm Kevin Haggerty. That's Mike Houston telling me to shut up. And in studio today, my buddy, he's been on the show before, Seth Roosevelt. How are you, buddy? Introduce yourself. Uh, Seth Roosevelt, thanks for having me, Kevin. I'm doing pretty good. I think this is my uh, third time on third, the show. Yep. Third time. Mm-hmm. So tonight, we're, you and I began to talk about, uh, <clears throat> you and I started talking about, uh, uh, about this this topic a month or six weeks ago, right? A month yeah, ago, I'd yeah. say. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, something we have to, you have to slow down and kind of look at. So what we're going to do tonight, we're not going to be able to really unpack it. It's 45 points. We're not going to be able to talk about 45 points here tonight in an hour, but we'll pick out three or four of them that are particularly, we've already picked out two each, essentially that are, are hit particularly close to home for us here in, 19, in, in 2019 from a book that was written in, in 1959. The Naked Communist is an interesting book, so we'll, we're going to probably start off with kind of letting people know what we're talking about in the first place. Uh, but it is, uh, I haven't read the book, but I've read a bunch about the book. I've watched some videos on it, and I've obviously studied the 45 points, and it's, it's chilling to think how, uh, how what they were talking about in 1959, pre-1960 revolution stuff, uh, actually came to pass and is still coming to pass so communism is still alive and well in the united states if you think of it in a subtle kind of uh kind of a back doorway big in american politics right now socialism and all that so it's uh, uh it's really pretty interesting this book by the way uh we'll start off by showing you that interestingly enough this book is available on Amazon. It's called The Naked Communist, Exposing Communism and Restoring Freedom. This is Volume 2, Freedom in America. Uh, and it is, uh, it is available on Kindle. It's free on audiobooks. Uh, and it's available on paperback for 1748. So this is a book that, uh, uh, that has been plugged by a lot of, uh, it's been endorsed by a lot of uh, kind of big names. Uh, so a lot of big name politicians have come back and endorsed uh, this, and uh, we have actually a video from YouTube on that very topic. Now this video video we're going to show now is from uh, Izzard Inc. Publishing. It was uh, it was uploaded to YouTube on May 28th, 2017. I'll put a link in the description below for this. Uh, but this is a uh, this is kind of the 60th anniversary of the book, and uh, what's become. Uh, what's become of this movement since then. So you're going to see particularly endorsements from some, some pretty heavy, honestly, Republicans uh, that have, or conservatives that have uh, uh, endorsed this book here at the 60th anniversary. Uh, but first, if you, enjoy the t- if you enjoy this show, if you would, subscribe, ring the alert bell. We'll let you know every time uh, new content is uploaded. I do need to get my subscribership up. Guys, the, the people that do watch the YouTube channel, the God Logic Project, uh, do watch quite a while, so my numbers are good that way, but I need to get uh, some more subscribers. I need to get to 1,000 for a couple of reasons. Yeah, uh, if any of my friends are watching, uh, please subscribe. Oh, yeah. thank you, buddy. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, another interesting thing about how I kind of found out about this was, uh, you know, back in January 1963, Albert Herlong, a congressman from Florida, who was actually a Democrat, is the one that uh, read the 45 planks in, into Congress. He wanted it into in the, the congressional record. Yep, wanted it in the record because he wanted to uh, show what the far left and the ideologues at the time, what what their plan for communism in America was. So, um, <clears throat> and and I'd also think as we go through this, 
I would imagine back in 1963, people would look at this stuff and be like, that's impossible. It would never happen. Never happen. They're yeah. never going to be able, maybe a couple of these things possibly, but they're never going to be able to implement these things. So when I came on to this uh, seven, eight years ago, and I was reading through all these different, uh, you know, it's one through 45, and each one of those, I was really taken back. I was like, wow, th this is happening. And yeah. one by one by, n n and there's a few in there that, you know, because we were still in the Cold War, and it has a lot to do with Russia. And, but as we get through the first, like, past uh, the first 10 of them, and some of the ones we're going to discuss tonight, they've, uh, they've really pushed the pedal to the, to the metal and implementing a lot of these things and well i was a teenager in the 80s so i was a teenager for reagan presidency uh the height kind of the, the fizzling out of the cold war so i i'm somebody that uh in in my early years in the 70s and 80s lived through uh lived through the cold war and the idea that uh that at any moment everybody could drop bombs on each other and the world would end, right? So this mm -hmm. was, for people my age, born in the 60s or 70s, this is what we, in the 50s, this is what we dealt with. Um, you know, I was, I was born in 67. So uh, I was 10 in 77 and I was 20 in 87. So the, uh, this was all during the Cold War, pre-fall of, uh, of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, it, it's always been, to me, I'm still from the generation where communism is bad, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, now there's a new push. There's a fresh new push in America in America now for socialism. Stalin said social the uh, the goal of socialism is communism. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, this there is a huge push on the left in the Democratic Party particularly to uh, institute more and more socialism into the American government. Get us I'm afraid get us all reliant on the American government, and then uh, then we we we'll, we would have essentially taken the, the center of power from the people and given it to the government. So now we work for the government rather than the government working mm -hmm. for us. Now people will argue, and probably pretty true, that that's already happened. That happened years ago. Uh, there's a lot of things wrong with our government, but we don't have to make it more wrong by becoming socialist or mm -hmm. communist would be my argument. Uh, and I'm, you know, Ocasio, uh, our, what's her name, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? Mm -hmm. She's 20. AOC for short. Yeah, she's 20 something years old, mm -hmm. so she doesn't remember the Cold War, right? She doesn't she didn't grow up with the same idea, the mindset that we had for mm -hmm. uh, for communists being the enemy and uh, it was an insult if you're fooling around with your buddies to call each other a commie, you know. Right. Uh, but that doesn't make very much sense to the new generation. So maybe it's important that they that they would get a look at this and it some of this some of this stuff is scary, so the effect mm -hmm. on our churches, on our schools uh, and on the media, and we're going to talk about those three points here today. But those, the effects of of uh, of that socialist or communist push mm -hmm. into the American society, uh, we see it now. We've had plenty of time, sixty years, to see that they've done very well. You have to hand it to them. Right. Uh, they've done a really good job infiltrating things like the media and and uh, and the school system, and certainly influencing then uh, our church system, our you know our Christian mm -hmm. heritage. So it's really pretty interesting. And it. I don't know how many more times they they want to try this because if we look at the in the 20th century, communism has killed over 100 million yeah. people. Yeah. So I don't know other than natural causes that might be the number one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that might be the number it one. It probably surpasses <laughs> natural causes. <laughs> yeah, the number one cause of death in the world is uh, uh, communism. Socialism, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and and we just saw it again, right? We just watched uh, Venezuela. And, and we saw how that all played out. Troops running over citizens mm -hmm. in, in, in armored vehicles. I think the, uh, I always joke that people that have an economics degree and still like socialism, uh, I think their professors just skipped the 20th century because it was absolutely disastrous. The 20th century was mm -hmm. absolutely a disastrous a, attempt at socialism around the world. We're seeing it even now in Venezuela. And there's a very big difference between, uh, between having social programs and being a socialist country. So uh, it's not the same thing. So the argument that, well, we're already, you know, a socialist country mm -hmm. because we have Medicare or we have uh, Social Security. Not really the same thing, though, is it? So the uh, end, by the way, how well did our government handle Social Security? Right. And where's all that money, you know? Post office. Yeah. You know. So there is, uh, uh, to, if it doesn't work, my thought would be if it doesn't work, uh, doing it even harder isn't going to make it work any better. Right. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So let's introduce them first to this book. Now, uh, 
like I said, this is from Izzard Inc. Publishing, and this is just a 60-year review of the, I don't know who made this video, actually. I'll put a link in the description for all the media we show. Uh, but this is, uh, uh, this is kind of give you a, a look at who's endorsed this book uh, at the 60th anniversary. The Naked Communist by W. Cleon Skousen. Ronald Reagan, President of the United States, added his own endorsement. No one is better qualified to discuss the threat to this nation from communism. You will be alarmed. You will be informed. All right, right away we see W. Cleon Skousen, who's the author of The Naked Communist in 1959, uh, was it... We, People should know he was an FBI agent, so he's using his uh, in all the FBI, almost all the FBI worked on back in the day in 1959 was communism, right? It was mm -hmm. it was McCarthyism and communism and the Cuban Missile Crisis, and that was the height of the Cold War when this book was written, uh, and it was uh, it was well received then. It sold millions of copies when it when it came out then, and it's it's seen a resurgence, and it's probably seen a resurgence because it's got plugged by a few guys that we're going to look at here, including of course. Uh, the great Ronald Reagan, uh, a Republican would say anyway, the great Ronald Reagan, uh, who would be now a centrist. Or, you know, he wouldn't even be a conservative anymore. So let's see. Formed. Dr. Ben Carson, surgeon, philanthropist, journalist, and candidate for U.S. president, said the book opened his eyes to the workings of America's greatest enemy. The Naked Communist lays out the whole progressive plan. It is unbelievable how fast it has been achieved. Radio host Glenn Beck said, Skousen predicted someday you won't be able to find the truth anywhere because the history of this country is going to be hijacked by communists. I think we are there. All right, right away. Uh, first of all, I should say that uh, Glenn Beck, by the way, uh, is a guy I used to listen, to listen to in the plumbing truck and it was entertaining on AM radio here in Tampa Bay. I would listen to it. He had, you know, it was cool to talk about conspiracy theories, and those guys all together were very funny, so it was entertaining when I was driving around in the truck. Uh, but I always kind of thought of him as some kind of loony bin conspiracy theory guy. So, and you know me, Bigfoot, UFOs, I'm, I'm, I dig all that stuff. So, and I just lumped, kind of lumped Glenn Beck into that group as well uh, until, what, 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in the year 2012, around then, we had three things that happened that were absolutely amazing to me to, that they were able to happen in the United States. And the first one was the uh, NSA was collecting our emails, right? And that was earth shattering at post 9-11. Uh, and then the, uh, uh, the IRS came out and said that they were, uh, they were slow tracking Obama or conservative. Uh, 5013Cs. 5013Cs. So they, they wouldn't get such a voice uh, pre-election uh, for the for Obama's re-election in 2012. And then the big one, the one that really, uh, in a lot of ways, broke my heart in some level because it, uh, it was the Benghazi attack. So then just a month or so, a month or two before the election in 2012, our embassy in Benghazi is attacked by, by ISIS, who was supposed to be have been eliminated, eliminated by Obama. He was saying that the war on terrorism is over, basically. Mm -hmm. And there's a terrorist attack. So they, uh, A, left those guys there to die, which kills me. Uh, they left Americans. You tell me we in 13 hours we couldn't get anywhere in the world in 13 hours with fighter jets. I find that hard to believe. Uh, now, that a lot of the blame of that, of course, went to Hillary, who was heading up the State Department at the time. Uh, but that was that crushed me that we would put politics or we'd put an election before American citizens. So that changed the paradigm politically, I think. Or for me, it gave me a, a, a stunning glimpse into the underbelly of politics, if that makes sense. So right. the and you may want to mention what the Obama administration, what they said the blame was for Benghazi. Right. So what what did they say? You tell them. Uh, they said it was a reaction to a cartoon, a video. A uh, YouTube video. YouTube video. Not mine, by the way. Yep. Said that it was not a uh, uh, terrorist. It was a... Protest. Pro protesters. Got out of hand got out of hand, and they, they put that narrative across. And not only did they do it once, they did it a, a few different times. And it, it's, in, in my opinion, and what a lot of people's opinion was, was because they because Obama was saying that ISIS was a JV, that they, that they weren't worth. Uh, the war on terrorism's over. I, he's got an election in a month mm -hmm. or two. Now, that's a little bit off topic, but we see that, to me, it opened my eyes to the idea that uh, 
we have uh, a very different government than kind of you hope for in your mm -hmm. heart. Does that make sense? Yep. And there are certain things that uh, there were certain milestones. We talked about it before the show in American history that kind of opened my eyes a little bit more. So I, I was I was amazed at the re, at the uh, reaction to the O.J. Simpson verdict. I thought it was a good verdict. Uh, and but I to see white Americans angry and black Americans joyful uh, and that they thought he didn't do it and white people thought he did do it. And I thought he did do it, but the case, he should not have been convicted on the case mm -hmm. they made. Um, I was shocked to see the results. So there's certain points in American history for me that uh, kind of change things, you know. Mm -hmm. And when I consider things, sometimes I have to consider them in their historical context. So when we watch these videos, I, I think to myself, is this pre-9-11 or is this post-9-11? Is this pre or post O.J. Simpson trial for me personally? Uh, is this uh, pre or post Obama? And is it pre or post Trump, uh, Trump? Because things now, since Trump got elected, you know, and, and the, the election leading up to the you know, the, uh, the campaigning leading up to the election changed the paradigm as well. So things are, the, the political pendulum is swinging so far out of control right now that it's, it's scary if you're an American and, and if you're like me and have kids, uh, it's, it's a scary thought to think what kind of America we're going to leave our kids moving forward. And boom, then we're looking, then you bring me something like this. Don't make me feel any better, by the way, buddy. You only make <laughs> me feel worse. Uh, so this is uh, really worth taking a, uh, a, a look at. Now, I, like I said, after those three things in 2012, I began to listen to Glenn Beck with a different ear. Does that make sense? Yep. So I began to have respect for this crazy conspiracy theorist. Uh, all of a sudden, the things that I thought could never happen mm -hmm. happened back to back to back. And, and it was right up Glenn Beck's alley, sort of. It's the kind of stuff he said would happen one day, and I'm like, that could never happen in America. So that is, uh, let's go back to the video now and, and see the other endorsements. J. Edgar Hoover, the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation That's a good man for 37 right there. years, <laughs> never endorsed books, but came close when he said, kind of a lazy I feel guy. certain that your efforts on <laughs> so this important I. subject, communism, will receive widespread attention and consideration. So that is a that is a brief video of the uh, that is a brief video of the Naked Communist uh, 60th anniversary. Now, what the Naked Communist is is a list of 45 goals for the Communist Party, uh, and I've got a PDF uh, file opened up here where you can get a better idea of uh, of uh, what the points were that they were trying to make. And then you and I will speak on just a certain number of them. But uh, right away, this this is a PDF, and I'll put a link. This is from Restoring America, Restoring Hyphen America. Dot com and I'll put a link for this uh, PDF in the in the description below after the show but uh, uh, this is uh, you know things you would expect so this is the Soviet Union uh, kind of versus the United mm -hmm. States right uh, January 10th 1963 Congressman Albert S Herlong jr. of Florida figures uh, reads a list of 45 communist goals into the congressional record now this guy was a Democrat mm -hmm. well, I would have I wouldn't have guessed that but that's very cool it gives me some hope uh, the list was derived from researcher uh, Cleon Skousen's book, The Naked Communist, which we just spoke about, and these principles are well worth revisiting today in order to gain insight into the thinking and strategies of, of much of our so-called liberal elite. And so that would be what we're going to talk about. So that is, uh, I think, uh, academia. I think that is, uh, I think that is ac uh, the media, right? I think we're seeing this in, certainly in our government, but on TV, in movies, in our colleges, we're turning our children over uh, to almost indoctrination. So what's, what strikes me as crazy uh, is my left-wing friends that I went to high school with. Now, they graduated from a nice high school, a mm -hmm. nice Catholic high school that I went to uh, as, a, as a kid in New York and Staten Island. I didn't. I left there. I got kicked out there a little early, <laughs> uh, but the uh, two years early. Uh, but they, they've all went on to really good schools, right? So the the Dukes and the Georgetowns and the Rhode Islands and, and those types of schools. And uh, to a man, they agree absolutely on every political point that ever comes up. So they, they never differ within each other. And that, to me, is creepy. And so that is almost a sign of indoctrination. And we'll, we can take calls on this uh, uh, in, in a little bit on the show, and we'll, we'll see what people think about all this. But the idea that, the, that they could possibly agree on everything uh, – just it's, it creeps me out. I mean, these are guys that I respect, I love, uh, I know they're smart, uh, educated guys, but they all hold a very 
even if they try to contain themselves, they all hold a very left-wing, socialist, anti-Trump fervor that the Trump derangement syndrome is true, you know? I mean, I, I can't believe the way people react to Trump, the way he kind of suckers them, but they, uh, uh, they, uh, today they were celebrating on my YouTube feed uh, that the stock market was down eight, 800 points. So they, uh, and this is something they warned me about uh, before the 2016 election that the stock market would crash and it didn't, it doubled mm -hmm. or whatever it did. Uh, so the, uh, now it's gone down 800 points and, and they're happy about it. So this is the American economy is tanking and that's a small price to pay to get to Trump, to embarrass Trump or to be little Trump, who I'm not a big fan of. Mm -hmm. You and I have had this conversation for right. a long time, but he's doing a good job. I mean, by basic, uh, a, basic uh, standards, standards, traditional standards that we use for a long time. He's doing a good job. There's no way you can say he's not. If he could stay off Twitter a little bit, he'd be doing a lot better job. <laughs> <laughs> he could yeah. just stand on what he's doing. But he get, he gives them so much. And, and Trump is not stupid. I think that uh, part of what he does on Twitter, there's might be a method behind that that madness. To, uh, he knows how to play people for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. So he's uh, and they bite and they bite hard. Yeah. Right. So then they uh, and they never go back on what they say. They double. I, I always thought that uh, the left would, uh, after the Kavanaugh hearings, after uh, all the embarrassments, the Trump, mm -hmm. the Russia thing, that they would then cool their jets and come up with a different strategy. But they double down on the insanity. Like mm -hmm. they they then. Uh, they then one one lies, the other one swears to it. They don't uh, they don't ever step away from and I'm talking about the media and the politicians, particularly in the in the uh, college professors and these guys. But they double down on the insanity they were talking about in the first place. Uh, the, the insanity that has essentially has been three inter, three uh, very expensive uh, uh, hearings on the on the uh, Russia gate thing. And all three came up with almost nothing. Right. Yeah. Trump's a moron is what they came up with. Mm -hmm. Trump's got a big mouth. He's a moron, whatever. He's not a politician. We knew he wasn't a politician. And uh, it looks like those things are starting to uncover some, some other dirt on, on the other side too. You know, we, yeah, sometimes but it'll we, never go back that way. Right. I think because the media protects them, mm -hmm. right. And the colleges protect them. So they are mm -hmm. in, in, in really good position to kind of do whatever they want, circumvent uh, the American constitution uh, to maintain power. I mean, like, uh, Jeffrey Epstein just committed suicide under suicide watch. Allegedly. Allegedly. Uh, and I, <laughs> I don't know if it's true or not, but I just saw, uh, I just saw a, a website feed that was uh, listing all the folks that, uh, that had mysterious deaths or early deaths uh, who were related to the Clintons and how. Mm -hmm. And it's like 40-something. It's not five or six. Yeah, it's a preponderance of the evidence. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <For sure. laughs> so um, they, uh, but it'll never go that way because I think because the media protects them, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about here. So let's go back to our list. Uh, so these are the forty-five things we're not going to talk about all of them, but should should U.S. should accept coexistence as the only alternative to atomic war? Uh, I kind of remember that. Uh, you should you U.S. should be willing to capitulate in preference to engaging in atomic war and. You know, they should. I don't know if they should give in, but, or obviously they didn't have to give in. Uh, anything's better than atomic war. I mean, it really is. Mutual destruction. Yeah. Uh, guaranteed destruction mm -hmm. of both parties is, is disaster. You know, it's, it's, in, in, it's the end of the game. So uh, develop the illusion of total disarmament by the U.S. would be a demonstration of moral strength. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Right? So we did kind of hear that narrative a little bit. Uh, then they go into extending some long-term loads, grant recognition to China and the U.N., which happened. Uh, set up East-West Germany, Germany separate states, allow Soviet satellites in the U.N. So there's one you passed up that I wanted to uh, just talk about. Keep going up, keep going up. Uh, where they permit free trade yeah. between all nations, regardless of communist affiliation. What's Trump doing right now? Kind of the opposite of that, right? Yeah. I, With China, so to speak. He's... Uh, yeah, yeah, we've had free trade around the world, regardless sometimes of ideology, until we do embargoes and stuff like that we have with Iran and, and North Korea. Uh, but the uh, uh, what he's done now, and I, you know, I'm not sure, I don't know enough about global economics to say if tariffs work or not, but it does seem to me if they're going to add extra cost to the sale of our stuff in their country, we should add extra cost to the sale of their stuff in our country. The problem is then for people like you and I, mm -hmm. Ham and Eggers, uh, we now are paying extra for these things, and, and that's got people upset. So I don't think that the tariffs were ever going to be uh, uh, 
I don't think they were ever going to get China to back down or drop their tariffs. And I think it, we're in for a kind of a little bit longer, more painful uh, transition until things level out again. Uh, my thought is always I'm not a globalist. I'm a nationalist. So our president should be acting and working in the best interests of the people. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but how the how tariffs play into that, I'm not 100 percent sure that I I would know enough to speak into it, except that it logically makes sense. Uh, I know uh, Ben Shapiro is not a big fan of tariffs, and and even his explanation, who I tend to agree with Ben Shapiro, mm-hmm. uh, I I I don't think I follow his logic very well. But you know, he's a Harvard little prodigy genius, and I'm a plumber, so yeah. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so maybe. Well, 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 I think with the tariffs, it it, it will cost. If if we put tariffs on uh, China, it's going to cost Americans money. There's no doubt about it. The thinking that I that I don't know if I agree with or not is is that when you create these tariffs, maybe it creates some pockets of jobs, possibly. Yeah. But but the pocket of jobs compared to the price of everything going up at Walmart, for example, where probably I'd say what ninety percent of their stuff is uh, made in China. Probably. It, it's going to cost uh, Americans some money. So. Uh, Trump actually, I think he mentioned it yesterday or today, he was putting a squash on the tariffs for this Christmas. Uh, oh, was he? Yeah. Get through the holidays? Yeah, get through the holidays. Get through an election, maybe. Yeah. Uh, well, he's a politician now. If he wasn't a politician before, he's learning. He's getting yeah. good at it now. So the, uh, uh, so I don't know that I'm, I'm, I'm dead set on lockstep on with Trump on the tariffs. And I, it's mostly because I don't know enough about it mm. to really speak intelligently or even a little intelligently about it. But the uh, some of these are, are a little to me a little more uh, a little more uh, interesting than others. So you would look at something like uh, do away with loyalty oaths, and we see that constantly with the Pledge of Allegiance in schools, and and certainly in the NFL, yep. uh, the allegiance some from millionaire athletes, by the way, mm-hmm. uh, and the only country where you could be a millionaire athlete probably uh, that they are uh, there are displaying their lack of uh, uh, lack of reverence for things like the American flag and so on. So, uh, and that's a different argument we won't have unless people want to call in a little while and have that argument. That's fine. But uh, capture one or both of the political parties. Done. Mm-hmm. Uh, Check. All right. Here's a good one. Here, get control of the schools. Use them as a transmission belt for socialism and current communist propaganda. Uh, soften the curriculum. Get control of teachers associations and put the party line in textbooks. So there's a lot there. They've certainly taken over our schools. So mm-hmm. uh, if you go back to the 50s, right, uh, prior to, uh, you know, the, the free love uh, revolution of the 60s, if you go back to the 50s pretty much, or even in the 60s, pretty much half the people were hippies and half the people were square. So when we think 60s, we always think everybody was a hippie, but it really was like 50-50. It's not unlike it is now, right? So... Uh, so the hippies, the, the, the conservatives or the squares kind of went into uh, Wall Street. They went into uh, big corporations. They went into pharmaceutical corporations and those types of things, which was smart because they made a lot of money. But they, uh, uh, the left, the hippies, or ended up going into education. They ended up going into the media, television, uh, and stuff like that. And uh, so they... In, in 60 short years, they have really been able to, less than 60 years, they've really been able to flip the table on America and, and really control the narrative, very, uh, very Marxist-like, uh, control, the, control the education system, you control the, the mind, you know. Uh, so that is, uh, that I think has definitely happened. Uh, they've, they've used it for a certainly left-wing agenda, right, socialism and current communist propaganda, They've mm-hmm. softened the curriculum. I think we see that more on the uh, on the high school level, right? And they've broadened the the liberal arts in the colleges has become very uh, subjective, mm-hmm. right? So uh, uh, they they're if they can't construct a paragraph or a sentence, they can certainly if they construct a good thought, a good left wing thought, they can still get a good grade. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, so there is a uh, there is kind of uh, they've been very effective in that, and that's one that I think we needed to talk about because they've uh, uh, they've been so successful at it. So, uh, in fact, we have a YouTube video for that. We might as well do that one now, right? Absolutely. Uh, this is a PragerU v- uh, video, 
And this is a guy that you and I both like. We watch a lot. And this is a five-minute video we'll kind of pick apart a little bit. But this is uh, PragerU with Jordan Peterson. Dangerous people are teaching your kids. Boom. You may not realize it, but you are currently funding some dangerous people. They are indoctrinating young minds throughout the West with their resentment-ridden ideology. They have made it their life's mission to undermine Western civilization itself, which they regard as corrupt, oppressive, and patriarchal. If you're a taxpayer or paying for your kid's liberal arts degree, you're underwriting this gang of nihilists. You're supporting ideologues who claim that all truth is subjective, that all sex differences are socially constructed, and that Western imperialism is the sole source of all third world problems. They are the postmodernists, pushing progressive activism at a college near you. They produce the mobs that violently shut down campus speakers, the language police who enshrine into law use of fabricated gender pronouns, and the deans whose livelihoods depend on madly rooting out discrimination. We're little or so the dean now, the, the role of the dean in our colleges and institutions, it appears, is to get, uh, is to make sure that the students don't get their feelings hurt. So they, uh, they seem to, it's almost like the inmates run the asylum now. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, and it's, it's good that there is a strong political voice for students in colleges, right? But there should be two, not one. What we've done now is, uh, what we have now on our hands is a, a leftist ideology controlling the universities, teaching a leftist ideology, and then acquiescing to the leftist ideology when you see, you know, uh, right-wing speakers, mm -hmm. uh, Berkeley being busted up, University of Wisconsin, the whole uh, debacle at Evergreen University. Uh, it's hate speech. It's all considered uh, hate speech now. Everything they disagree, mm -hmm. and this is a whole different episode, a whole other podcast, but everything right. they disagree with is hate speech. That's That, that becomes very hard to... Uh, to uh, battle because you then if you discredit you make an ad hominem argument you discredit the person rather than the point it becomes very easy to dismiss a, some, uh, an opposing opinion because they are a racist we're seeing it big time with trump right now right uh, mm -hmm. i i'm not a w big fan of trump but i don't see him as being a racist i barely see uh, that he said very many racist things now he said things that i wouldn't say uh but uh and that i don't agree with but that doesn't make them racist right just because i don't like it just because Pastor Kevin doesn't like it or, or Kevin the plumber doesn't like it doesn't mean doesn't artificially automatically make it racist. And that's, I think, where we've kind of gone awry. But let's look at this video a little bit. Or none exists. Their thinking took hold in Western universities in the 60s and 70s when the true believers of the radical left became the professors of today. And now we rack up education related debt, not so that our children learn to think critically, write clearly or speak properly but so they can model their mentor's destructive agenda. It's now possible to complete an English degree and never encounter Shakespeare, one of those dead white males whose works underlie our society of oppression. To understand and oppose the postmodernists, the ideas by which they orient themselves must be clearly identified. First is their new unholy trinity of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Diversity is defined not by opinion, but by race, ethnicity, or sexual identity. Equity is no longer the laudable goal of equality of opportunity, but the insistence on equality of outcome. And inclusion is the use of identity-based quotas to attain this misconceived state of equity. All the classic rights of the West are to be considered secondary to these new values. Take, for example, freedom of speech, the very pillar of democracy, the postmodernists refuse to believe that people of goodwill can exchange ideas and reach consensus. Their world is instead a Hobbesian nightmare of identity groups warring for power. They don't see ideas that run contrary to their ideology as simply incorrect. They see them as integral to the oppressive system they wish to supplant and consider it a moral obligation to stifle and constrain their expression. Second is rejection of the free market of the very idea that free, voluntary trading benefits everyone. They won't acknowledge that capitalism has lifted up hundreds of millions of people so they can, for the first time in history, afford food, shelter, clothing, transportation, even entertainment and travel. Those classified as poor in the U.S. and increasingly everywhere else are able to meet their basic needs. Meanwhile, in once prosperous Venezuela, 
until recently the poster child of the campus radicals. The middle class lines up for toilet paper. So Venezuela right away was uh, Bernie Sanders for years was Bernie Sanders uh, high watermark for socialism, mm -hmm. right? That they they uh, uh, they took the uh, vast oil supply, uh, put it under control of the government instead of private oil companies, uh, and the wheels fell off as it always does, right? So so far. Uh, socialism hasn't worked anywhere. And the argument is always, well, it just hasn't worked anywhere because they haven't done it right. Uh, but Margaret Thatcher said it best. She said... Uh, run out of people's uh, money eventually. Yeah. <laughs> she said socialism's great until you run out of everybody else's money. Right. Somebody has to produce something. The government doesn't generally produce anything, so it becomes a problem. Uh, well, that doesn't look too bad. You don't even have to go to Walmart to get toilet paper. Yeah, well, you said <laughs> bread lines are <laughs> yeah. good. Yeah, you just they just hand it out in the street. You know? But the problem is this makes perfect sense. This is kind of what I was getting at earlier, but this makes perfect sense to young people. So millennials really think that uh, it, bread lines may not be a bad thing, right? Uh, that is that is contrary, but they didn't live through the Cold War. Mm -hmm. you know, the, well, so the... Uh, they have a very different worldview, very different idea of, uh, and, and of course, this being a post-Christian America, a uh, double whammy for me, mm -hmm. uh, but this becomes, uh, uh, this makes perfect sense to them where it doesn't to people that have been around a little bit longer. Uh, and I wonder how they, how college professors get through economics or history uh, and make, and, and possibly make socialism look so good. So the, uh, we'll go back to the, uh, the video. We'll see what they say. Third and finally are the politics of identity. Postmodernists don't believe in individuals. You're an exemplar of your race, sex, or sexual preference. You're also either a victim or an oppressor. No wrong can be done by anyone in the former group and no good by the latter. Such ideas of victimization do nothing but justify the use of power and engender intergroup conflict. All these concepts originated with Karl Marx, the 19th century German philosopher. Marx viewed the world as a gigantic class struggle, the bourgeoisie against the proletariat, the grasping rich against the desperate poor. But wherever his ideas were put into practice, in the Soviet Union, China, Vietnam, and Cambodia, to name just a few, whole economies failed and tens of millions were killed. We fought a decades-long Cold War to stop the spread of those murderous notions. But they're back in the new guise of identity politics. The corrupt ideas of the postmodern neo-Marxists should be consigned to the dustbin of history. Instead, we underwrite their continuance in the very institutions where the central ideas of the West should be transmitted across the generations. Unless we stop, postmodernism will do to America and the entire Western world but it's already done to its universities. I'm Jordan Peterson, professor of psychology at the University of Toronto for Prager University. You know, what's interesting about Jordan Peterson is that he's considered a classic, he considers himself a classic liberal. Yeah. You know, and uh, he is absolutely appalled by what is going on. I mean, this is kind of, I've heard some of his uh, talks on what's going on in uh, colleges, and this is a light. Yeah. Yeah, this is Jordan Peterson light. And uh, he uh, realizes that um, paying, we're paying tax dollars, uh, parents are paying, and these kids are just not getting a real. And they're b they're borrowing money to be indoctrinated. It's a perfect system, really, yep. if, it's a, if, it's, uh, if you wanted to look at it. Uh, as a hustle, uh -huh. I mean, it's perfect. So pe we're sp the government's spending money on it, uh, the parents are spending money, and, and the kids are borrowing money against their education, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm one of them, right? I still haven't paid back my student loans. So they, uh, uh, they are, um, uh, but they're no longer being taught how to think, critical thinking, like he just talked about. They're mm -hmm. being taught what to think, and this is the scary part. I just saw at George Washington University, they want to take uh, the white guy, in the crosswalk, the white digital guy, <laughs> they want to take that out. That uh -huh. there, there's a petition that that's oppressive, uh, that that dude is white. Uh, I don't know why, or that it's a man. I'm not sure what they're super upset about. They want to make it rainbow colored, or I don't know what color we'd use besides white. But they uh, green, mm -hmm. I guess for go. Uh, but they want to get rid of that because it, it's it's uh, 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 it's offensive and triggering to yep. to uh, 
the left now and and this is it, we laugh and it's funny but it's not that funny it's pretty right. serious mm -hmm. uh, that that uh, democratic socialists of america video that went around all the social media platforms i thought was a parody i, I didn't think it was real <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know they, they're raising their hands like this instead of clapping so they don't trigger anyone uh, they're fighting with each other for 10 minutes on and the meeting hasn't even started yet laying out the, the rules of what's acceptable for a couple hundred people at that meeting now it's funny to us, uh, but it's not funny to them. It's it's literally their reality. So then, uh, then what do we do with uh, with how do we then plug those people into a capitalist economy? We almost can't, right? So the uh, uh, they are, and by the way, there's something like fifty six thousand members of the Democratic Socialists of America. I would have never guessed that. So, which scares me. Again, it's an eye opener for me. Mm -hmm. So, how many members of the alt right are there, or white supremacists? I think a couple thousand, right? Right. Are there more? I have no idea. And there's really no number on that, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I when I hear them, uh, Chris Cuomo crying about being called Fredo the other day, uh, and threatening bodily injury, she could have been arrested for that. Yep. And he it, said it, he said that was right. That's just the knee jerk reaction. Now it's racist. You and there's videos that. of him oh. saying it. Right. And there's videos of other anchors saying using the Fredo thing for mm. Donald Trump's son that's not part of the administration, Donald Trump Jr., he's the Fredo. So it, it certainly isn't racist, right? Now, Chris Cuomo has a history of calling everything racist. The left has a history of calling everything racist. The problem with that is eventually you're going to create racist. Mm -hmm. So eventually nobody's going to care, right? So if everything is racist and, and on, the only way for me not to be racist is to change my ideology, these guys are going to become racist. And I think we saw that in El Paso. You know, the, the, the rhetoric that they hang on Trump is nothing compared to the rhetoric coming out of the left constantly mm -hmm. that it, Trump is a neo-Nazi, and if you support him, you're a neo-Nazi. Uh, now, I don't know where I fall. I voted for him, and I'd probably vote for him again so far. So does that make me a neo-Nazi or a white supremacist? I find that hard to You know, that's a hard sell. So uh, they're, they're not doing well delivering their message, right? They've, they've kind of gone off the reservation. They're just that crazy, and it shows. Yep, and— in my identity politi politics is the textbook definition of racism. Yeah, yeah, it is. And in fact, the uh, uh, it does it in a, a disservice or an injustice, I think, to the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. If you if you then tie everything to, uh, it's it, all they ever say is, well, it's like the it's like slavery. It's like this, the, you know, the Jim Crow laws. Well, it's not like that. That was horrible. Mm -hmm. Right. That is not a moral issue. That is, uh, regardless of where you stand on things like gender fluidity and everything else, to me as a pastor, that's a moral issue or a psychological mm -hmm. issue. Uh, that's not the same thing as being, you know, owning slaves, right, which is very different than biblical slavery. And that's another thing that we tend to get wrong when we make the argument against Christianity uh, promotes slavery or agrees with slavery. Christianity facilitated the Underground Railroad. My own denomination, the Free Methodists, facilitated the Underground Railroad. We got the idea somehow that uh, that maybe Harriet Tubman did it all on her own, mm -hmm. right? Or that uh, Rosa Parks did it all on her own. Uh, but uh, essentially, the, uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of white Americans in all those time periods that were, we, so we fought a civil war over it, right? There's a lot of white Americans that were willing to die for civil rights. You don't get you don't get that delivered in the school, right? You never really hear that, and and there was a lot of Christians. Christians facilitated all of these things, mm -hmm. right? The idea that all men are created equal and endowed by their Creator with a capital C is a Christian ideology that we're all made in God's image. It comes from Christianity, so they uh, but the, they don't teach the kids that, right? They teach the kids that Christians are basically white supremacists or hate everybody or who do they hate more? Uh, I saw a, a gay friend of ours just put a, a meme up on Facebook about that. And uh, I was yeah. a little, my feelings were a little hurt. Mm -hmm. uh, not, I mean, I love him, so uh, you know, I know where it's coming from. Uh, but the, uh, and it's funny. And just because it hurts my feelings doesn't make it the end of the world. And that's probably a good lesson to learn for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, when, when my friends attack Christianity, uh, which happens to me every day on, on social media, uh, I don't lose my mind over it, right? It, and it does hurt my feelings, but how much credence do I give to it, really? So just because something hurts our feelings uh, doesn't mean that it's it's necessarily uh, should be then be eliminated from society, right? Uh, and that is kind of what the God Logic Project does. Uh, by the way, is we we I'm trying to have uh, a, 
uh, one of our slogans is triggering conversation. I'm not trying to have conversation that triggers people. I'm trying to have conversations that trigger the conversation, that people, regardless of what they believe and how they believe, uh, can sit in here and talk uh, if they can do, you know, if they can control themselves and not just get to name calling. Uh, we can have a civil conversation here, and I think that's what's missing. We've, we've now uh, denigrated our, our political opponents mm -hmm. to the point where we can't even have – it's not even worth having a conversation with them. So if you are – if you're going to vote for uh, Tulsi Gabbard, who I happen to like, and she's hot, <laughs> uh, if you're going to vote for her, then, you, uh, then you're then you a socialist, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you're going to vote for Bernie, you're a socialist, certainly. But uh, the uh, – uh, I don't agree with her politically – but I don't hate people that, that like her. Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, and I'm, you know I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump, except that he's doing a good job. But I, uh, uh, that doesn't make me a white supremacist or neo-Nazi or everything they try to hang on Trump. And the rhetoric coming out of the media on the left is, is ten times worse than anything Trump's ever said. And I think that that's not a hard argument to make. In other words, uh, saying go back where you came from isn't inherently racist. I wouldn't say it. it's not a nice thing to say, but he makes a pretty good point. If you're so good at running a government and changing the world, why did you leave your own home country? Why didn't you apply these gifts of yours there? Essentially is what he's saying, right? Uh, why come here and, and, and fix almost a perfect system uh, or upset almost a perfect system? And it is almost a perfect system. Not perfect, but it's the best in the history of humanity. It's the, it's the best anybody's done is what we do here in America. Yeah, we're not doing a very bad job. Uh, so things are ultimately going pretty good now. Uh, I do want to look at that guy. Uh, this video, this video bothers me a little bit more. So this guy, uh, the way he talks and how confidently he talks about what I see as, uh, as a you know, a political heresy. Mm -hmm. uh, the way he talks is is uh, dangerous to me. So we are one of the few countries that have been under the same, we've been under the same constitution for 243 years. The, the average around the world is 17 years without a new constitution. So we are doing something right. We didn't get to where we are by doing something wrong. Uh, and, and so to look, at the, to look at the constitution, and I consider myself a patriot and a nationalist, uh, to look at the constitution the way that uh, this guy looks at the constitution in this next video would be akin to someone trashing the gospel maybe not as powerful to me as a pastor but mm -hmm. it's something that would bother me uh it bothers me to watch this video i'll be honest with you let's play this guy and this is from cbs news this was published january 27 2013 so this is during the obama administration he mm -hmm. had just been reelected for a second term uh so he probably had just january 27th he probably just took office for the second time right uh so that is the context of this video let's play this one here hold on I've got a simple idea. Let's give up on the Constitution. <laughs> All right, I'm already no, mad. <laughs> it sounds radical, but it's really not. Constitutional disobedience is as American as apple pie. For example, most of our greatest presidents, Jefferson, Lincoln, Wilson, and both Roosevelt's, had doubts about the Constitution, and many of them disobeyed it when it got in their way. To be clear, I don't think we should give up on everything in the Constitution. The Constitution has many important and inspiring provisions, but we should obey these because they are important and inspiring, not because a bunch of people who are now long dead favored them two centuries ago. All right, so right away, we're looking at a guy that, uh, uh, and this is part of the problem. This, these types of arguments make perfect sense if you're making that argument to people that agree with your argument. So we get in these kind of intellectual bubbles in college campuses, and in, you know, I always make the analogy, uh, coffee shops and gun shops, right? The conversation is, is pretty much uh, a bubble at a gun shop, Second Amendment, Constitution, uh, the things that I, by the way, agree with uh, or believe in. But the uh, but when, you, when you flip that over, uh, AOC has had those conversations a thousand times, but she had it with people that already agree with her. Right. So she's shocked when she says that we should eliminate cows and, and airplanes. She's shocked that people don't agree with that. But she's been having that conversation for years with people that already agree with her, right? So these bubbles that we get ourselves, these intellectual bubbles that we get ourselves into uh, hurt America. It doesn't help America. So we need to get, we need to get around the table 
you know, figuratively speaking, and really have a civil conversation about these things, and we can't. And our boy Trump is part of the problem because he, he does punch back, and he, punch back, he punches back hard, and he punches back well. Mm -hmm. He's very effective at degrading his, his competition in an ad hominem sense. So he's not attacking their, their, uh, their ideology or their political position or their principles. He's attacking the person. And it's very effective, and it shouldn't be in America that effective for either side to do this, right. but it is. And that, that's what the left has been doing for years. Yeah. yeah. Y you know, you, you, you don't attack the issues. You don't debate the issues. You, you isolate and you humiliate the, the person. Yeah. And for so long, the conservative uh, viewpoint on this was, let's talk about the issues, let's talk about the issues, and just like we sh we're seeing under a microscope right now, the left is, it's racism, white supremacy, you know, all these things, and we're not talking about any issues, so that's what, uh, that's what conservatives, if you ask me, have been up against the last, what, 10, 15 years? Yeah. and they're, even when they're discussing issues, their terms are indefinable, undefinable, mm -hmm. so we don't know exactly what they mean exactly, by, uh, by white, uh, by man speaking, man shaming, mansplaining. Uh, we don't know exactly what they mean by. I think you're mansplaining to me right I'm, now. I'm mansplaining you, boy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't know exactly what they mean by, um, by uh, uh, dog whistling. That could be anything. Uh, microaggressions could be anything. Mm -hmm. You know. So the problem is there is no. It's all sizzle and no steak in the conversation. Right. So as soon as they start losing, as soon as anybody starts losing a, a debate, by the way, it gets emotional and it gets personal and it becomes uh, attack the person rather than mm -hmm. the principle. But if, you're emo if your argument gets super emotional, it's because your argument sucks, right? If your argument was strong, if your intellectual argument was strong, you wouldn't have to get so emotional. Right. And I get emotional listening to this. This guy? This guy here. And, this, and, uh, and he should shave, by the way. Does he think we think he's out chopping wood on the weekends? Look at him. <laughs> And he's also tying in another one of these uh, th these points that we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, one of he the big points. Uh, uh, discredit the founding fathers as old uh, aristocrats. That's what he essentially. Yeah, uh, and that is in. the that is the mentality Jordan Peterson just talked about, and mm -hmm. it's the mentality that he's talking about, and it's the mentality, it, it, according to these forty five tenants, mm -hmm. uh, that we that they had to do to undermine American society and their their commitment to the Constitution and capitalism and everything that goes along with it. And that unfortunately. The, the Constitution also contains some provisions that are not so inspiring. For example, one allows a presidential candidate who is rejected by a majority of the American people to assume office. Suppose that Barack Obama really wasn't a natural-born citizen. All right, uh, right away, do away with the Electoral College is their argument, because they win the popular vote because of California and New York. Uh, that's why we have an Electoral College in the first place. Uh, what scares me... And this is, uh, by the way, our government, too. So these, the, even the Democrats represent our country in a sense, mm -hmm. right? So people we disagree with, and this is why this is so important, do make decisions for our country. And, and, and it, you know, we love our country or hope we love our country, so this is a big deal. But they, they seem to want to let illegals vote, vote without an ID, 16-year-olds uh, vote now. Uh, or they're trying to get 16-year-olds to vote, and they're trying to do away with the Electoral College. Well, my argument would be if your platform is so strong, if you are so right, why can't you make a merit-based argument? Why do you have to make a, a personal attack uh, every time you do it or an emotional attack and never really say anything? And we see that in the Democratic debates right now. And then why change the rules if you're, if you're, so, if you're so right and you're so, your ideas are so strong and so progressive? They should win on their own merit. But why don't they? Right. So they control the media. They control the colleges. They control uh, movies, television, everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet it, it's still a 50 50 nation. How is that? That's interesting. How could they have so much leverage politically and socially and still only break even? I mean, it's no different than the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, 80s, 90s. You know, it's still the same. It's mm -hmm. still the same. Pretty much the same. Forty eight, forty eight, four percent undecided or whatever. It hasn't changed a whole lot. So the uh, the idea that they some of these arguments they make are just well, and you just laid it all out there. If it's fifty fifty now, how do how do they change the field? Do they change with better policies, better ideas, better things that will bring, uh, you know, conservatives or people, you know, because that's what the it always seems in uh, elections. It's always we we have to sway the independents. That's the 
th- th- that's the meter that determines who's going to be the next president, for right. example. Because you have a basic split, then you have these, you know, 15, 20 percent of people in the middle. So that you would think that that would be the base that they're trying to. But they uh, don't this year. Right. So what you mentioned was what they're laying out is let's change the Electoral College. Let's eventually, th- th- believe me, they're planned and they haven't quite said it yet. But uh, th- the reason for open borders is not because they feel bad for no. refugees and people coming in here. That is not why they're doing it. The reason they're doing it is because their plan is, is that once they get enough people, they have enough of a voice. And uh, with that voice, then they should be able to get them to uh, be able to uh, get them at the, at the voting booths. And you've seen it with driver's license. You've, you've seen that um, effort to uh, get that accomplished. And even in some, is it in California? I mean, isn't it not? I, and, and I don't know this for a fact, so I'll, but, but I've heard that they are allowing uh, people who are not citizens to uh, vote in some, some areas in some elections. And they, I, I know it's not They national. probably want to, but yeah. So the, in California is kind of a, a creature all of its own, a lot yeah. like Texas, right? But they... Uh, uh, they have um, they've gotten to the point now where they they kind of know they're not going to be able to sell this. Mm-hmm. What they need is people dependent on the government, mm-hmm. right? If you're dependent on the government, if you never bite the hand that feeds you, you'll always vote the same way over and over and over. Uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson said when he signed the Civil Rights Act, said I'll have these N words voting Democrat for the next 200 years. Mm-hmm. I mean that, he that's smart. I mean it's a terrible thing to say, but it's smart. Right. It's not American. I mean, right. to now the we watch the Democratic debates now and, and they're, you know, uh, free education, free health care, free thousand uh, dollars a month. Nobody would benefit from that more than me. Right. I barely get by every month uh, and I'm disabled, so I'm not going to be making big bucks anytime soon. Right. So uh, but get it, enough subscribers, you will. Yeah. So that is so please subscribe to the yeah. God Logic Project. So that is. But the point is, uh, it would be in my best interest. Right. Mm-hmm. If. if I got more free stuff because I need it, right, for for my situation. Uh, but it's not in the best interest of my country, so I wouldn't vote for it. Uh, so we need to not vote on individual issues so much. Abortion would be a big issue for me as a pastor, but it's not the only issue, right? I mean, it's a, to me, it's an embarrassment, a national embarrassment that we kill a million babies a year in, mm-hmm. a, in the most developed country in the world. Uh, but, it and that, so that's a big deal to me. And even before I became a Christian or a pastor, for that matter, it never made sense to me that that somehow morally was okay. Uh, but the uh, uh, it's not I don't vote uh, on a single issue. But we we with the identity politics, they they've got people voting on one issue and a single issue, right? Mm-hmm. Regardless of what it is, uh, Second Amendment, First Amendment, gay rights, LBGTQ, uh, women have to vote for women, uh, men have. To, uh, uh, Black dudes have to vote for black dudes. You know, right. it's it's bizarre. How is that your mm-hmm. qualification? How is Hillary being a woman a qualification for being president, especially with her track record? You know. Uh, so anyway, let's finish the video here. We're gonna end up going over an hour, folks. Yeah. Settle in. Yeah. Uh, Just so you know, me and uh, Kevin go into some complete rabbit holes. Yeah, we end up talking. Uh, we talk for two hours before the show. We talk for two hours after the show, and we text when. We <laughs> <laughs> so it, uh, it is not. Uh, yeah, we're not terribly professional, and I'm trying to make the God Logic Project more professional. And in that, speak for yourself, Ken. On that note, uh, it, would you please subscribe, ring the alert bell? You'll be alerted every time new content is uploaded. It's important that you interact with the God Logic Project. Uh, so, uh, if you um, if you see a post, if you follow God Logic on social media, and you see a post, if you can retweet it or sh- reshare it on uh, Facebook. That type of interaction helps the God Logic Project. It helps me get more exposure and then hopefully get more subscribers. And there's a few other things we can do once we have more subscribers. One of those is to monetize. There'd be ads then on the channel. And uh, this, this, I don't already don't have enough money. And, and so the 100 or 200 bucks I pump into this thing every month, uh, it could bleed me dry. If I could just make $200 a month, I'd be breaking even. Uh, so... Uh, uh, it, it is important that you interact with the God Logic Project. We're going to go live on the phones here in a minute. Uh, but let's finish the video. If you like this, give it a thumbs up. If you don't, give it a thumbs down. Comment. Let me know what's up. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I do reply to all the comments in YouTube, on YouTube th- uh, feeds. So uh, uh, that's it. Let's go back to the video. That was, that was me trying to be professional. That was not strong, by the way. That was weak. Wasn't bad. No. 
Don't, don't try to make me feel better. So what? Constitutional obedience has a pernicious impact on our political culture. Take the recent debate about gun control. None of my friends can believe it, but I happen to be skeptical of most forms of gun control. I understand, though, that's not everyone's view. And well, we I'm agree on something. talk with people who disagree. But what happens when the issue gets constitutionalized? Then we turn the question over to lawyers, and lawyers do with it what lawyers do. So instead of talking about whether gun control makes sense in our country, we talk about what people thought of it two centuries ago. Worse yet, talking about gun control in terms of constitutional obligation needlessly raises the temperature of political discussion. Instead of a question of policy about which reasonable people can disagree, it becomes a test of one's commitment to our foundational document and so to America itself. This is our country, we live in it, and we have a right to the kind of country we want. We would not allow the French or the United Nations to rule us, and neither should we allow people who died over two centuries ago and knew nothing of our country as it exists today. If we are to take back our own country, we have to start making decisions for ourselves and stop deferring to an ancient and outdated document. Okay, so that is, uh, that is, of course, like I said, that is a disturbing video for me. I don't know who this lady is. It's, it's, I'm on autoplay, so it went right back to playing again. Uh, that is, I disagree with a lot of what he just said. So to me, it's, uh, there's so much there that is a problem. And, and the, the idea that the Constitution, or the Bible for that matter, should be a fluid uh, document uh, kind of defeats the whole idea of, of uh, uh, having a Constitution in the first place. Right. So uh, have we done the American has the American project and the great American experiment been perfect? No, absolutely not. Uh, and there are there are uh, black marks on our record for sure. Uh, but if they are not as big and bad in the scheme of things as as they are made out to be. So uh, the left has a utopian uh, vision for America. So they compare us not to our the next any other system that's ever existed or the next uh best system in the world, they compare us to a utopian, some kind of perfect uh, existence. Uh, that, in our fallen state, as a pastor, I would tell you, in our fallen state, we'll never get there. But we're doing, we do do the best job in the history of the planet. Uh, and that is, I think, uh, that is, I think, going to be a more, it opens the door for a more progressive, in a sense, civil rights, uh, women's rights, uh, uh, slavery, uh, it, it opens the door to those types of things, but it shouldn't open the door to every bizarre um, moral relativism that, that we can come up with, right? Uh, so uh, one, on the Democratic debate, uh, one of the guys, Castro, uh, said, and, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but he essentially said, I'm not just for reproductive rights, which I'm against, and mm -hmm. I don't think it's a right to kill a baby, uh, personally, my opinion. Uh, he's, I'm for reproductive justice, so I want to make abortions free, uh, for Trans. the transgender community, mm -hmm. and and everybody cheered. I couldn't believe it. And I'm thinking to myself, does a man who's transitioning to a woman going to need an abortion? No. <laughs> and if a woman has transitioned to a man, is she going to need it or he's going to need an abortion? Uh, no, the answer is also mm -hmm. no. So, but th that kind of uh, that kind of uh, uh, micro cutting into the U.S. fat and the American fabric and appealing to Really, in that case, zero voters, right? And though it sounds good and people will respond to it, mm -hmm. if you really think about it, it doesn't make any sense at all, or it didn't to me, and maybe somebody can explain it to me a little better. But that was, uh, uh, that was what do they call it, um, intersectionality, mm -hmm. right? That is a, a, a blatant example of how they're, they're trying to divide us so that we would, uh, so that we would fight over you know, kind of silly things like... Mm -hmm. Uh, like a transgender needing an abortion, unless there is something that I'm not getting in that argument. Maybe that's some, an argument somebody made before, uh, but they're not going to need it in either case. So what the heck's he talking about, and why are people cheering about it? You familiar with Van Jones? Yeah, you know Van Jones is. Uh, I I <coughs> I was a fan of Van Jones to some extent. I wouldn't say I'm necessarily a fan, but I do like his uh, take that I heard him uh, have a. I, I don't know how long ago it was, but he was uh, saying that the. The Democrats and left are missing. They've missed the boat by pandering to these uh, 
because when we talk about transgender and we talk about some of these things, it is such a minute, small yeah. uh, part of the population. And what he's saying is the left and the elite, they've abandoned essentially middle America. They've abandoned the hard work, you know, the, the, you know, the democratic party, um, like my, uh, mom's democratic party, sure. for example, you know, the one, the democratic party I grew up in, mm-hmm. by the way, uh, you know, they were, they were farmers, Southern Illinois and, uh, you know, they, they were out to protect the, the, the working man and, you know, make sure that, uh, they didn't get screwed essentially. And, and they had a, they had a big following in the heartland of America, middle America, but they've abandoned. They, yeah. they have just. That's how Trump managed to take of that such a big. It wasn't uh-huh. the Russians. It was the silent majority mm-hmm. that were sick and tired of the status quo. And, and Trump represented a break from the status quo and delivering, by the way, uh, more so than any politician I can remember. Mm-hmm. So the. Uh, uh, the left created Donald Trump. Yeah. The left made. Put the opening there and he just bulldogged his way right through there. He was on every talk show, every conservative talk show for two years saying, yeah, maybe I'll run, maybe I'll run, maybe I'll run. And every host was encouraging him to run. It, they, it was coming. And believe me, uh, and uh, Obama uh, swung the ped- pendulum so far right very well, by the way, very articulately, mm-hmm. very subtly. Uh, but he did uh, divide the country when he could have united the country even more. So I think our first black president kind of swung and missed. You know, he could have done great things, and he didn't. And I think he's done some damage. His legacy will long-term be damage, the damage he's done to our country. Uh, and and it, so there are, uh, you know, the police acted stupidly, uh, not speaking up against Black Lives Matters and, and some... Uh, Ferguson and, you know... Yeah. Yep. Trayvon could have been my son. Uh, so kind of coming out against the cops and... And dividing us globally, by the way, apologizing for us around the world, and then dividing us racially here at home, uh, it's heartbreaking to see. And uh, I think if I, by the way, somebody asked me who I'd rather ha- uh, have lunch with, Trump or Obama, and I'd probably pick Obama, uh, although because uh, I already agree with some of Trump stuff, you know. Right. So, uh, but I think Obama was a great uh, orator. Uh, part part of what kept me from wanting to vote for Marco Rubio is he was a one-term center that gave a great speech, young and handsome, but we just tried that for eight years and it didn't work well in my opinion, so why would I go back to that with somebody else, you know? Uh, so uh, uh, I was kind of a Ted Cruz guy mm-hmm. in, in the primaries. I, you know, Well, you know, uh, I, w- I was the last one to get on the Obama. <laughs> <laughs> I voted, I decided that morning to vote for the Supreme Court and I mm-hmm. voted for the Vice President. That mm-hmm. was my plan. And what's uh, interesting is Trump essentially has and it's in another one of these communist uh tenets that we look at is to try to legislate through the courts rather than uh through executive order and legislate through the through the courts rather than congress and you know trump has basically derailed a lot of uh a lot of the things that obama implemented uh and the reason he was able to do that because a lot of things that obama did was through the courts yeah and a lot of the things he did was through executive order and so, you know, even look look what's happened with uh, Obamacare, for example, you know, because that basically got didn't didn't get passed. It did get passed, but then the Supreme Court, you know, the ruling through the Supreme Court and about the mandate about the fining people for not buying something was uh, a big problem legally. Right. Uh, oh, they, what they call it a mandate or a tax? They essentially yeah. said that this is this is a tax. So yeah. since uh, since we're going to call it a tax. Uh, then we'll let it roll through. Yeah, but it is essentially it was a fine for not purchasing what the government wanted you to purchase. Mm-hmm. Creepy in America, right? May yeah. happen all over the world. Maybe happen in Europe right now. But Europe isn't the standard for us. Right. We tend to look, or the left tends to look at Europe as, as some great success with open borders and and socialism. Europe, Western Europe's a mess. It's an absolute mess. Uh, and they, uh, but they they talk about it like it's like it's wonderful. Now, as a Christian, I would tell you that uh, church attendance in Western Europe, which was the bastion of Christianity for mm-hmm. for tens of centuries, uh, church attendance in Western Europe now is is below nine percent, right about nine percent. Uh, so uh, Christians in in Germany and France and England uh, attend church on average nine uh, percent of them atter- attend church once a week, uh, which to me is a nominal baseline Christian, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so the uh, if you're only going to church, uh, if all you do is go to church once a week, you're probably not a super strong Christian mm-hmm. anyway, in my estimation, right? Uh, 
so the uh, uh, so to hold up Western Europe as some kind of prize for all this, and, uh, what's her name? Andrea Merkel, Is that uh, uh, Germany, Germany lady. No. Uh, she's already saying that our open border policies was a terrible idea, and it was her idea. Yep. You know, and it, but they're now overwhelmed with with this, particularly Syrian immigrants and everything that goes along with that. So, and that is that globalist mentality, where uh, if they were like England is trying to be now, if they were had took more of a nationalist, and when I say nationalist, I don't mean white nationalist. I mean, put my if you're the president of my country, put my country first, right? If I wouldn't hire a football coach so we can tie every game, right? Or to win some or lose some, I hire a football coach because I want to win every game. Right, and that's kind of how I look at the president. If you're, if the president isn't, uh, if his singleness of purpose isn't to make America great again, right, or to keep America great, however you look at it, uh, the argument being America was never great. It's a terrible argument. I mean, it was never perfect. That's a that's a fair argument, but it's been great for 243 years. Right, and we've had some ups and downs, and we still have a big down right now. With, you know, we've killed 70 million babies since 1974. Right. Uh, that's brutal. Uh, so anyway. Uh, your daughter is uh, peeping in here right now. Well, I'm busy, tell her. Busy. <laughs> Some of the other things that we uh, that they mention in this, and again, I'll put a link for all these videos, and I'll put a link for this PDF uh, in, in the description below. Uh, but to gain this control of uh, of the school system, certainly we talked about that already. Uh, Let's go r real quick back to the Constitution. Yeah. Why do you think that they want the Constitution be a, a living, breathing document? Well, I think they want to uh, to be able to... We had a single standard, and the Constitution provides a single stand, an objective standard for how to run the government. Uh, what they want, moral, relative is, moral relativism has them, my truth and your truth are two different things, and we don't get to speak into each other's truth. So the truth now is no longer objective. Mm -hmm. We're on the objective side of the scale, now on the subjective sky, side of the scale, the problem is we can't have 345 million different truths. There's a truth and there's a lie, and and uh, there are gray areas between them. Mm -hmm. But the truth, but the bottom line is, it provides a baseline, a Judeo-Christian baseline for how to run a government, right? Uh, and it's worked, right? It's based on you know ancient Rome, uh, the Roman Republic, and it's based on Judeo-Christian values and Western values, and it's it's worked amazingly mm -hmm. right uh now they in the colleges i'm afraid in the colleges and and in uh even in high schools uh they talk about you know they'll only talk about slavery jim crow uh they mention they fail to mention uh or they they will imply or tie together with that kind of the evilness of of the christian worldview mm -hmm. and, and uh colonialism and things like that uh now they that same christianity that they malign they don't teach these kids that Christianity has uh, financed the Renaissance in the 1500s, right? The Catholic mm -hmm. Church financed the Renaissance. They uh, developed the university system, hospital systems, uh, everything that we pride ourselves on now, Harvard, Yale, mm -hmm. uh, Cambridge, Oxford, all the Ivy League colleges were Christian-founded universities. The framework now, where we now, where we sit right here having this conversation is what the, in my opinion, is what these principles are uh, built on. And sometimes when you see, like, our guy there who's saying that, you know, we should just get rid of the Constitution, it's like you're, you want to pull the framework out from underneath you that you're yeah. sitting on yeah. uh, right now. And you mentioned it, what was it, 17 years is the average? Uh, yeah, the average constitution, constitution mm -hmm. uh, for any government has been 17 years on average worldwide, and our, we're at 243 now, so. Right. It's not bad. I mean, it speaks volumes into into that this system works. Can it be fixed? Is it working in a utopian sense? No, and it probably never will. Uh, but I would be careful oversteering the ship. Certainly, I mean right. that would be disastrous. Uh, but and and that's my problem that the uh, uh, that the United States has uh, our colleges and our institutions have uh, denigrated uh, American uh, exceptionalism. Uh, and that brings up Obama again, who says that America isn't that all that exceptional. A lot of countries are exceptional. Well, not everybody can be exceptional. Right. Uh, but the very definition mm -hmm. of being exceptional is that you're exceptional. Right. And very people are beating down the door and swimming across uh, rivers yeah, to get into this They're country. dying to get into this country, and they're not dying to get out of it. Right. Right. I think, who was it, Dinesh, that said that he wanted to go to a country where the poor people are fat? 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And if you decided what you ate for dinner tonight, you're top 30% in the world, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and uh, so the uh, – uh, anyway, I'm gonna we're going to wrap it up here soon, but I, uh, something that I – we're just getting started, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> Something, yeah, this is how it always goes. I'm like, we're going to do one hour. And Craig Lloyd the other night was on for two and a half hours with me. We've already been on an hour and a half almost. Well, we started late. Hour and 15 minutes we've been live. Right. Uh, so the uh, one of the things that I wanted to show in here that I've now got to find again, now that we've talked about all this other stuff, uh, well, belittle all forms of American culture. We've kind of talked about that already. Uh, infiltrate the churches and replace revealed religion with social religion, discredit the Bible and emphasize the need for intellectual maturity, which does not need a religious crutch. Uh, this is, they have been insanely successful with this. And, and I'm not just talking Joel Olstein, uh, who was on Oprah. And he's, by the way, he's accused of saying that Jesus isn't the only way to God, uh, that there's multiple ways to God. He didn't say that. He said there's multiple ways to Jesus. Mm-hmm. So if he's he's not guilty of saying there's multiple ways to to get to heaven, he's he's saying that it's just Jesus, but that there's multiple ways to get to Jesus to get to God. My problem with that is that's weak, right? That's not bold. He's not he's ashamed of the gospel. It seems like right, but it gets worse than that. There's a guy named John Bell also talking to Oprah. By the way, Oprah's like the Antichrist. <laughs> uh, sorry, sorry, uh, Facebook. I didn't mean that. Anyway, uh, and not our John Bell either. Let's yeah, make sure. no different John Bell. Yeah. But there's a pastor named John Bell. I don't think he's a pastor anymore. But he was sitting with Oprah, and he's saying that uh, that Christians shouldn't base their their morality on two thousand year old letters. Well, that's what a, a pastor does, mm-hmm. right? That our job is to interpret two thousand year old letters. It's kind of the main thing we do, right? That's what a pastor does more than anything else. And here's a pastor denouncing uh, the morality of the gospel, and he's he's left the church since then. And uh, then the guy uh, Carl Lentz from Hillsong, uh, from whatever church he's from, but he, uh, uh, he was on The View, and, and they asked him flat out if abortion was a sin, and he wouldn't say yes, right? He hemmed and hawed and did the political correct thing. Mm-hmm. He was ashamed of the gospel. He was weak in his response, uh, and it was, it, to me it is exactly what they're talking about, soften, have a social message. Jesus was a Capricorn type of approach. You know, Jesus only loved, and uh, it, it, a lot of the gospel— it's very hard to, uh, with a with a twenty twentieth and twenty first century Christian worldview, even it's hard for me to come to grips with things in the in the Bible, like Jesus turning over tables and making a, a whip of cords and and uh, messing up the temple and calling in in Matthew twenty three. If you read Matthew twenty three, he brutalizes the Pharisees, the church mm-hmm. leaders, calls them hypocrites like ten times. You know, uh, so it is uh, it is, but that's the gospel. Right, and we have a church that is so afraid to preach the gospel that they might not fill the church up, that they might hurt people's feelings. Uh, that is, and it's very hard to maintain a Christian worldview in a post-Christian America, and that's where we are, and that's what the God Logic Project is. But regardless of how I feel about the person at the other side of the table, my first, as a pastor, my commitment has to be to Scripture, has to be to, to, to the body of Christ, to the church. Uh, and and uh, I'll be honest with you, my commitment then to my country is secondary to that. It uh, doesn't mean that I don't love my country, but I love my, 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 my relationship with my creator more. I love the work of the cross more. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, but we see, you know, the faces, sometimes the faces of mainstream Christianity, the Joel Olsteins, the Carl Lentz's, and the John Bell's, uh, balking on the gospel. And so they've been very, very successful in, in kind of watering down Scripture and then taking, uh, 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 taking uh, uh, making evangelical Christians seem like they're all Bellevue Baptist guys. It's like 12 people go to the Bell- <laughs> Bellevue. They just get yeah. on CNN a mm-hmm. lot, but th- nobody goes to that church. No, Christian, I've never met a Christian. I'm a pastor. I've never met a Christian with the same worldview or the same doctrinal ideas that they have at that church. Right. That guy, Stephen Anderson in, in – uh, bunch of nut jobs yeah and they but that is they want to compare their center to our fringe and Mm -hmm. and then we kind of want to do the same thing but it's not fair it's not a strong conversation and that's kind of what uh what bothers me the most about it so the uh that was one point that we i definitely wanted to touch on in the uh because that hits home to me so the two things on this list and there's a lot and guys you can look at this yourselves uh but there's a lot on this list that uh it's just scary how successful they've really been when you look at this from uh, 60 years ago, 
they've they've done a good job. It it does seem to be I, painting out the way they talked about it. When I was researching some of this on Monday, and I don't know the confirmation with this, but uh, one of the commentaries I saw with this is that they've accomplished all these except one. Which one? I don't know. I didn't. Uh, the phone rang or something. Oh, okay. Uh, so we'll have to. We can do part two then. Okay. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> in the meantime, guys, uh, if you like the show, please subscribe. Uh, if you like what we talk about here, uh, press the up, uh, give it a thumbs up, share it on, on your social media. If you'd like to be a guest on the God Logic Project, we can do it remotely, electronically via the Zoom app. Uh, email me at godlogicproject at gmail.com. Uh, I'd love to have you on the show. You don't have to agree, by the way. I don't want this to be any kind of intellectual or conversational bubble. I want people to be able to uh, if they can do so rationally and calmly, you know, uh, and well, uh, we'll talk, I'll talk about anything you want to talk about. And, uh, I don't feel intimidated by any topic, even if I don't have the answers to it. Uh, so if you want to be on the show, if you got a story, by the way, if you run a ministry or a business that's doing kingdom, kingdom work, certainly like to have you on here. And I'm very involved in the Tampa Bay recovery community. If you're in Tampa Bay or in the state of Florida or anywhere, really, if I can help, if you have a family member struggling with addiction, Email me, Pastor Kevin at God. Lo- I mean, email me at GodLogicProject at Gmail dot com. Uh, let me know if there is not a resource I can get to you uh, that I have. I'll find somebody that does, or I'll let you know. But I'll steer you in the right direction. If there's anything the God Logic Project can do to help you guys, uh, boots on the ground, make this a better world, uh, and, and help fight addiction and and uh, bigotry and hatred and all the things that we see uh, in America, uh, that's really what I want to do. So uh, that's it, uh, Sethy boy. Thanks, Kevin. How do you want to close, buddy? Um, what do you want to say to America? I want to say thanks for watching and uh, go ahead and subscribe because uh, Kevin needs a little more comfortable chair here. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody gave me those chairs, and yeah. they aren't comfortable. <laughs> and I uh, I sit on a bar stool because I got a bad back, and I can't sit in a regular chair. Uh-huh. So you'll notice I sometimes I'm higher, sometimes uh-huh. I'm lower. So sometimes I'm really halfway standing up while we do the show because it's hard for me to sit for an hour. Mm. Uh, so it's been... Uh, Sometimes when I take the camera off me, I stand up real quick. You've seen it already. Mm-hmm. I stand up, stretch my back, and sit down uh, while the videos are playing because I can't sit very long. Uh, well, that's it. That's our show, guys. We're gonna do. We come. We try to do something live every week. This will be. Uh, this will be, of course, uploaded with the with the links to all the videos we refer to. Any links we refer to will be uh, in the description uh, below. Uh, comment down there. Share. Interact with me. No problem. We're just two regular guys that talk about stuff, so you don't have to feel intimidated. If you if you've got a particular uh, background or education on any of these topics and you want to you want to uh, chime in, glad to talk to you. No one's told you they love you today. God loves you. So do we. Receive that. Be blessed, and we'll speak soon. Thank you. Thank you for supporting the God Logic Project. And if no one's told you they love you today, God loves you. So do I. Receive that. Be blessed. We'll speak soon. This has been a Rev Kev production. Your mileage may vary. Shut up, Kevin.